Welcome everybody to our Avis webinar today. My name is Christina Heller from Avis Product Marketing and I will be your host today. I'm happy to introduce my colleagues Tom Thaler and Julian Krummeich, both from Avis Product Management, who will give you an overview of robotic process automation with Avis today and show you how to make RPA successful with a process-driven approach. Before we start, I want to indicate that all lines will be muted during the webinar to avoid any background noises. The session will be recorded and we will provide a recording afterwards. You'll have the chance to ask questions at any time in the chat window and we will have a Q&A session at the end where you can ask your questions directly to our experts. Now it's my pleasure to hand over to Tom. Yes, thank you very much, Christina. Um, also a warm welcome from my side. Um, as Christina already mentioned, my name is Tom Tala. I'm a product manager um, at Software AG, and I will do the webinar today together with my colleague, um, Julian Krum, I'm also product manager in the RS area. So um, yeah, again, our topic today, RS RPA powered by Crying. Crying is our technology partner um, in the area of RPA, especially for um, the implementation of robots for uh, task mining. Um, so you will learn in the next, um, yeah, I think 45 or 50 minutes and what we are actually talking about. And we will focus on a process driven approach, uh, approach sorry, um, which we um, established and uh, want to propose and and give you an overview on that in order to um, yeah, give you a tool at your hand um, to be successful with your RPA projects, with your RPA initiatives, um, and finally also scale with RPA. So before I start, um, I want to have a look, a brief look on the um, agenda for today. So. Um, we will um, first of all start with, yeah, I think a general introduction on what um, we are actually talking about with RPA. Very short, I assume that most of you already know RPA, um, of course. Um, so we will um, especially focus here on the challenges um, of RPA. So what is the problem? Um, second, um, I will give you an overview on our process-driven RPA approach. So this is um, really the point where we come to the solution. So how can we solve the challenges, the problems um, that are there today with RPA? And um, of course, we will also show you that directly in the tool in the system, um, how the approach um, and the different uh, tool components look like, um, how it works like, how it feels like, um, to give you the best possible impression um, in this uh, time of the webinar today. And finally, of course, we will have a short recap and um, I think also some minutes um, for a Q&A session. Okay. So then let's start with um, yeah, a general view on uh, robotic process automation. So what we're actually talking about. So again, I assume that most of you are already more or less familiar with RPA. So you know RPA, you know more or less what it is. Um, just to um, try to summarize that a little bit. So actually we are talking about some uh, software pieces, some software robots especially that are performing, uh, that are performing tasks tasks that are typically executed by people and um, there are specific characteristics um, so in general we are talking um, about an automation of tasks that occur on a quite high volume um, that can be easily described so they follow some simple rules that are, that, that are quite repetitive and um, a very um, important characteristic for um, RPA bots is that they are replicating human interactions um, with their computers, with their applications they use to execute a process on the UI level. So actually they are acting in, in a similar way as um, people or, um, or, or employees would um, do that. Some typical use cases um, we see in the RPA area are um, yeah, transferring data um, between different systems um, where an API is missing. So I don't know, from Salesforce to SAP um, or, or things like that. Um, reporting um, things, reporting tasks. Um, you have handling of, of emails, for example, as well. Um, so just to give you um, an overview on um, what the typical use cases are. So, um, in general, um, when we are performing such RPA initiatives or RPA projects, um, we see some different phases 
in such projects. So um, typically it starts with a discovery phase um, where you have something like an ideation um, of what could be automated in the project. Yeah, so, you, so you have to find some ideas, some candidates of um, processes, of activities that should be automated. I think you know that maybe from your own organization that there are um, a lot of people that have a lot of ideas on what could be automated. So typically it is not really a problem to have the ideas. Um, the question is finally, is it complete? Um, did we find the most relevant um, automation candidates um, or even not? In the second phase, so we need to um, analyze the processes on a very, very detailed level. So we need to um, have knowledge on the click level, actually, um, in order to be able to implement a robot, um, which will finally do the job. So very, very deep knowledge. Then it comes uh, to the design of the solution. So we need, of course, a possibility to describe how the solution should look like, what should be covered by a robot, how um, can it cover by the robot? Um, so this is a conceptual phase, I would say. Um, the development, so of course we have to implement the robot, we have to deploy the robot and do the operations of the robot, and finally we need, we need some governance um, around that. If I have now a look on the um, today's market of RPA, <clears throat> I think it would basically look like this. So. Um, Sometimes you have uh, some possibilities to do the design, sometimes some uh, process mapping capabilities in order to design the base structure for um, the later robot development. The actual development is, of course, in the core of um, uh, the RPA market today. And um, of course, um, also most of the parts of the deployment of, and, and of the operations um, as well. This actually needs, uh, leads to um, some, some challenges of course, since especially the discovery and the analysis phase to the pre-automation phase is mostly missing. So that's, this leads to the fact, so this is a KPI, which was, um, by the way, identified um, by Deloitte, so um, that about 50% of all automation opportunities are missed in such an um, such so they are just not um, discovered, and this is, uh, might um, absolutely be a problem um, in the in the real world when we want to improve our business. Um, second, and I think that is also um, a very critical aspect which is not uh, seen at any time, that about 70% of the uh, resources that are spent for RPA projects are typically spent to the pre-automation means to the, discover, uh, to the discovery and especially to the analysis phase and not to the actual robot development. So um, what does that mean? So typically this comes especially from the um, analyze phase. The reason for that is that especially in that phase where you have to capture the knowledge on a click level, you have to talk to people. You have to do some workshops. Um, you oftentimes have some biases when you talk to people. You need several iterations until you have the right knowledge here. So um, this is um, very, very time consuming and um, might be critical um, from the business case perspective of such uh, projects. And finally, and I think that is also a quite interesting indicator, um, is that um, only 4% of the enterprises applying RPA scale across 50 robots. So this is really a problem since um, obviously we have a problem here um, to, to scale with RPA. Um, this might come from an unclear business value, which actually does not mean that there is, uh, that there is no business value, um, but in fact, um, many organizations does not um, do the effort to um, calculate that afterwards or to prove um, the return on invest finally. So this is exactly the situation we are faced with today, and this is exactly what we want to try to overcome, um, which is also the reason why we try um, to cover all the different phases. So really the RPA projects from end to end, from the discovery to the, uh, to the governance um, with the process-driven approach, our back crying, of course. Um, okay, how does it look like? Maybe one big picture. So um, we clustered that, of course, in different phases. Um, I want to give you a brief overview and then go a little bit into the um, details, maybe also some recommendations for you as well. So first of all, um, we say, okay, 
um, we want to apply some uh, proven approaches like BPA or BPM, business process management, um, together with process mining in order to identify the most relevant, business relevant uh, um, automation candidates. Yeah, so maybe some of you already um, have a process repository, um, some kind of documentation of your business, of your process landscape, and this is a very good and solid basis for the identification of the um, really relevant things um, to do RPA. Second, the analyze uh, phase. So um, our approach is here to say we um, apply an intelligent task mining approach. So um, the idea is here to have a robot um, that is installed on the client computer in, or, and, and which tracks the interaction of the people that are executing the processes um, with the applications they are using. So with that, you really get an unbiased view on what is happening in reality. Yeah? Third, the design. So um, the idea is here, of course, to design the solution, to map the solution, and bring that or embed that into a process landscape, which in that case would be a robotic process landscape. We will see later on um, what I mean in detail with that. For the development, um, our approach is here um, to use the results we um, already get from uh, the phase two and then uh, analyze task mining um, and three, of course, to uh, perform a one-click automation, which already delivers um, yeah, a first prototype, um, a working robot already um, in your development environment. Finally, um, we have, um, first of all, deployment and operations. So, of course, you need to roll out not only the robots, but also the information around the robot. So what is executed by the robot, how the robot is working. You need to communicate this to the um, organization. This is really a critical aspect. And finally, of course, also, this is a part which is very, very often missing, capturing the benefits. So what you actually have to do is to um, collect all the information you need um, to be able to validate um, the success of your RPA initiative and also very important, communicate this to the management in order to get the buy-in, to get the ownership, also to get the budget, of course, to grow with RPA um, within your organization. Okay, maybe um, a little bit um, or some words to um, the different phases I have here on the screen. So, um, first of all, let's start, of course, with the discovery. So, the point is here that um, it really makes sense to focus on the real business problems. So, um, as I just mentioned, of course, it is never a problem to get some uh, candidates, some potentials um, for automation. Um, but um, what makes much more sense is to really say, okay, let's analyze our business and uh, let's identify the problems we really have in reality, um, which leads to some situations we don't want to have, that we lose some customers, that we lose A high level before then going um, into the details. Maybe only one example for that where we just uh, uh, saw that. So, um, Goal. Goal is a Brazilian um, airline and they um, decided to use um, RPA a couple of months ago. Um, so, actually, what they did, um, they focused on a core process. Um, for them, which is an update of the flight schedule. Yeah, so this is really a strong, or that was strong uh, business pain point for them. The reason for that was just that they uh, needed really highly skilled experts in order to do um, uh, or to perform this process. So you have to update this, you have some changes um, in some circumstances, uh, circumstances, and this is really something which needed um, 20 days for several people, again, highly skilled experts, and um, the success they have here um, by focusing on the core process for them um, is really impressive. So they were able to reduce processing time for this process um, to, um, to four hours versus 20 days again. And the experts are now again able to, to focus on what is really uh, important on the, um, in the organization. Before I come to the analyze phase, I just mentioned the term task mining. Um, I get this question very, very frequently, and th therefore I already want to, to try to answer it now. So um, the question is, 
um, okay, there is a process mining approach and there is a task mining approach. Isn't that more or less the same? Or are there differences? Of course, there are differences. And um, let me draw that a little bit on, on a big picture. So um, let's start, of course, with the people. Yeah. People, um, employees actually, are performing some steps, some clicks, some user interactions um, with their computer and with the corresponding applications. Um, they have to do that in order to perform some tasks, yeah, generally. And um, again, these tasks are executed with different application systems, different application systems that are included or involved in the execution of a process. Yeah, so you have a customer relationship management, an enterprise resource planning system, or something like this. So a lot of systems that might be involved here. And um, this is exactly the point. So the databases behind uh, the systems, these are the touch points for process mining. Yeah? So the process mining is performing some analysis based on the digital footprint coming from the application system or from, uh, or from the IT systems um, that are using to execute the process. And um, as you might see already, um, the focus is here really on an analysis of the end-to-end -end processes um, to really have a big picture on that. In contrast to that, task mining um, is tracking the user interaction. Yeah? So task mining looks at the different steps, at the different clicks the user is performing in order to, um, to execute the different tasks. Yeah? So here we are really focusing on the user interactions again with um, the focus on automation or even automation potentials, of course, um, with the ultimate goal to, um, to generate um, some RPA bots, the robots, finally. And um, this is, so with that, I come um, all the way to, to the second phase, the analyze. Yeah? So um, what we actually want to achieve with that is that, that we really say, okay, we want to pre prevent a bias a bias we have when we talk to people and when we do some workshops. We, of course, also want to reduce the time we need um, for that. And um, also a recommendation is that uh, it makes definitely sense to start with some standards, with a standard use case. Yeah, Only add some variation, some additional complexities, there's really a business case. So um, what we actually um, see quite frequently is that organizations um, try to capture the process. They have a lot of information, a lot of um, exceptions in the process or different uh, uh, passes um, during the execution of some processes. And they try to cover all that different aspects um, with one robot, which will um, drive complexity um, immensely. So um, this is exactly what we say, okay, just just don't do that, really focus on, um, on the standards here and um, start with that first. Um, by the way, so um, already this leads to the result that um, you are able to significantly reduce the pre-automation time. So the experiences we have here already um, is that we are talking about four weeks in contrast to uh, four months. So this is really, really, really significant since you don't need um, that mass of, of interviews and workshops and things like that. So that makes it much, much easier and reduces the RPA development time by 50% by already. Um, one example for this, by the way, also um, is uh, EDF. Um, for those of you who don't know EDF, so EDF is um, the, uh, the largest energy supplier in, in, in Europe, so a really large organization here, and um, with a headquarter in, 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 front, in France, and um, they did it exactly that way. Yeah, so they um, used the technology in order to identify um, the um, yeah the most often occurring um, process alternatives I would say so um, what they actually um, from a business point of view wanted to um, achieve is that they want to automate their financial transactions yeah? so they apply robots here and um, already until 2020 so they started um, one and a half um, year something about that ago um, with that initiative um, and they uh, had a look at the processes 
um, they automated that step by step. So they um, tried to investigate the situations which lead um, to um, automation breaks and they solved that really step by step. And they will um, have um, a plus of uh, 45 percent financial transactions performed automatically um, already until next year. So I think also this is a very great achievement and shows um, how this uh, should work in reality. Okay, then the process design. Um, what we see um, also quite frequently is um, that you captured now the process and you say, okay, let's automate this and you directly jump into the automation. Um, this is something we definitely do not recommend. Yeah? So please do not automate a poor process. So have a look at it um, try to capture the, uh, it, try to map it and um, really improve it first. Yeah. So the idea is really um, to document um, such robotic process landscape and um, yeah, finally um, make the best out of it. Yeah. So improve the processes before you automate. The development. So I just mentioned that. Um, our recommendation here is also to say, okay, please enable the business. I think that is very important since the business people, the um, employees in the business are exactly the people that know the processes best. And therefore, um, again, I come back to task mining. You can very um, good apply the task mining in order to um, capture the detailed knowledge directly um, from the interactions of the employees performing <laughs> the processes and um, then hand this over um, to the IT. So, of course, um, you have here a possibility, maybe you can see it here in the background already, download automation. So, um, with that, you can um, just export a robot from the task mining engine, import that into your um, RPA development environment. Um, of course, with that, you, you, you won't have the final robot um, already in place, but you have a very, very good technical foundation already for the IT, um, which can then refine, define the different business rules that might be necessary. Um, make it solid, make it robust. Um, so this really saves a lot of time um, in the RPA development. Another possibility, of course, would um, as well to um, to try to do something like a screen capturing. So there's only, uh, also a modus on this, um, which allows you um, as uh, which allows you to just record the interactions um, with the system when you're executing the processes, and um, the result will actually. Exactly. Then deployment and operations. Of course, you have to roll out the robots um, uh, from a technical point of view, but of course also um, from the business point of view. Yeah? So you need to communicate to the organization um, what the robots are doing, um, how they are doing this, um, what are the actual steps in the processes they have to perform themselves, what are the situations um, they have to perform themselves. Um, so this is really the idea of that. First, and second, also measuring the compliance to some business rules. Yeah, so you have, you might have some rules here which are not from a technical nature, and this is something you can um, uh, operate here and then monitor in fact. And finally, um, just one sample dashboard. We will see that later on um, in life, of course, as well. So capture the benefits. Try to collect all the information that might be relevant also for the management. I think that is a very important uh, aspect here um, in order to communicate the return, of, uh, the return of investment and the success of your RPA project. Really consider um, the processes from end to end and uh, talk the language um, of the management respectively with the correct KPIs here. So this is um, basically an overview on the approach and this is exactly what we want to show you and uh, now in a live demo and with that I want to hand over to Julian for a moment. All right yeah thank you Tom for sharing all these different steps in our process driven RPA approach and I'm very happy now to start our demo so that you have a feeling how it looks and works in reality. So as Tom mentioned at the beginning, the starting point for any RPA initiative should be clearly to identify where is actually the business problem. So in our example today, we want to focus on the pre-sales management. So assume we are here a digital company 
And as you can see here, uh, depicted on a high level, you see our value chain of the presales management. So we do a lot of digital marketing. So we roll out digital campaigns on LinkedIn, etc. Then we handle all the leads that are coming in. Then, of course, we are demonstrating our products to our leads and potential customers. And then if they are interested in our products, we handle the orders accordingly. So what we now want to do is we want to start with process mining to see how this process looks in reality. So as you can see here in our first overview dashboard, uh, you see that here the process cycle times are quite nicely distributed. So in average, it takes 15 days to complete a, uh, an order process. But as you can see here on the top right, most of the leads that we receive are actually uh, lost at the end. So, so we have uh, more or less 100 customers that we won in the considered time period, but we have almost the double number here that we lose. So that's of course not good. So that's something that we want to change and want to tackle uh, in our process. So what is maybe the reason for that? For this, of course, you can start with process mining. So here, the discovery of the process flow. So what you can see here is nothing that was manually designed. So this is really coming out of your application systems. So it shows how the pre-sales management process really looks like. So typically, it starts with a customer request that we're receiving. Then we create a lead and qualify it accordingly. And then at the end, either we want the customer and receive the payment at the end, or we lose the customer, or another option is, of course, also that we qualify the lead out. So let's first have a look at the happy passes. So I filter here on all the processes with a positive uh, ending. And what you can see here is the following process. So as I said, you receive a customer request, then we create and qualify the lead. In the ideal case, we contact the customer, but as you can also see here, when we, yeah, when it takes too long time to reply to a customer, we get additional requests. So they are asking, okay, I uh, asked you for some product information to get some, some more information, but you didn't reply. So that's, of course, a bad signal that we want to uh, prevent in the future. It also contributes to a longer process cycle time. So as you can see here, it takes almost one day from start to create a qualified lead then more or less one day to contact a customer. But if this takes longer, so a little bit more than three days, then we receive all these requests. Okay, but what is maybe the reason, and that's also our business problem, that we lose actually our customers. So let me focus on these parts of our process and ask our so-called root cause miner, what are potential factors that contribute to a customer lost? So I asked the system over here, and then based on the data in our system, it tells you potential uh, root causes. And here, the most prominent one is that we do not respond in time. So the customer is requesting something from us, but we don't reply in time based on certain SLAs that we have established internally. And that's, of course, something that we want to prevent. So this is actually our business problem. So I applied it over now, and I would like to see where is a potential automation uh, benefit that we want to leverage. As you can see here on the left, this is again the process when we lose the customer. And on the right, you see all the activities again, and it is also shown uh, which of those can be or should be automated. So on the x-axis, you see the number of activities and on the y-axis, you see the processing time of all these activities as well. And then, of course, it's, it's, it's obvious that we want to automate those activities that are in the top right because they are frequently executed and also it takes a significant amount of time to complete those activities. And as you can see here, based on process mining, we first of all identified that the step create and qualified lead should be automated and also the contact of the customer. So exactly those two steps at the very beginning, because when they are not fulfilled in a, in a successful manner, the customer is not happy and at the end, 
we even lose them. So with that, we have identified an automation potential, which we want to, to leverage in order to tackle this business uh, problem. And how this works, I would like to hand over to Tom again. Okay, thank you very much, Julian. So let me again share my screen. All right. So um, again, I'm here back um, at this end-to-end -end process um, for that leader pre-sales management. And um, so what Julian just demonstrated is that we obviously have some problems um, in the phase until um, the contact uh, until contacting the customer was especially here in the area of lead handling and um, for this um, I would like to have a look at the as is process so how the process actually looks like um, today so what happens in fact um, okay um, I get a customer request um, in so this um, comes as an email to um, some regional sales um, um, administrators or operators and um, they have to create a lead and sales force they have to look up some additional prospect details obviously they have to determine a lead priority um, they have again to update the lead and then send the call to action to the regional sales so to a specific account executive for example um, which um, should then um, yeah take the next steps um, send some product information and things like that so the first thing we see here is um, that, of course, um, we have some improvement potential here. So basically, the question is whether um, always um, a sales uh, guy has to work with all the different leads. Yeah, so maybe it makes sense, especially since we are determining here the lead priority and um, that we say, OK, if the lead priority is low, um, let's route them um, into a self-service channel, for example. Let's just send them some additional um, information um, directly via email without contacting um, the sales, for example, for that. But I think for all the other things, um, it is a little bit unclear what is happening here, um, in fact. So what does it mean to cre create a lead in Salesforce? How much is the effort? What do you need to do here? What means look up prospect details? I don't know. So um, this is a very good point where we should apply some uh, task mining, some process discovery in order to um, be able um, to, to, to know the details. And with that, I go um, into my um, process discovery or task mining console. Um, so um, again, what is behind this? So actually, um, we now installed um, some uh, so-called discovery robots on the client computers um, of the employees that are executing that lead handling um, activities. And um, I have here already three different processes um, in place where different uh, processes were covered. And one of them is called lead handling. So um, of course, that is, this is not something, so the name is not something the system can identify automatically. So of course, this is something um, I mentioned here or I entered um, for that. Let me just um, click into that uh, lead handling um, discovery. So what was identified here by, by, by task mining? So um, actually what you have here is a quite similar representation um, as a business process. Yeah? So you have a visual representation, of course, where um, um, with the corresponding capability to um, click on the different points here and um, to have a quick overview, a screenshot actually, um, of what is happening here or what the user um, is, is actually seeing. Yeah? So um, this comes directly from the discovery robot. So you have um, an automatic consolidation of the different um, um, executions here. So um, of course the screenshots are also captured automatically. So there's no manual effort. Um, this one's out of the box. Let me have a look into the detail whether I um, get some additional information on what it means to um, yeah to to look up prospect details and to determine the lead priority yeah so I see here something like a Wikipedia it's not hundred percent clear to me um, therefore I want to have a look at one concrete instance yeah so for that I just click here on the details and I want to view the user recordings and I just take one of them here so with that you really have the possibility step by step, click by click through the process that was executed. 
and I want to jump a little bit forward. So um, obviously, um, I um, am here at Wikipedia and I tried to find some additional information. In that case, obviously, the lead comes from Software AG. Um, I have a look at Wikipedia for Software AG. And as I can see here, so this is also generated automatically by task mining, that the user ha has a look or he copies the revenue and the number of employees um, and obviously paste it into um, the Salesforce formula. So this is obviously the basis for um, the lead prioritization. And this is exactly, of course, what we um, uh, what we can do or what could be automated because this is um, absolutely a good starting point for this. So with that, we have at least the details of the process. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, just to go back to this, I want to explain this a little bit more. So um, I mentioned in the analyze phase that it makes sense to start with some standard. Yeah. So you might um, already have seen this. So um, we have here a flow that is displayed automatically, which is covering 60% of all identified or discovered um, process executions instances, I would say. Yeah. So this is really the normal path that um, occurs the most often. Of course, you now have the possibility to add the additional variation that was identified. So with that, of course, it becomes a little bit uh, more complex. So this is really a sample here in reality. And the complexity uh, or the additional complexity is typically much, much higher. And that's exactly the reason why we say, okay, really start with the, uh, with the standard and then extend the use cases if it actually makes sense. Yeah. And with that, um, finally, you also, of course, have the possibility to just click the download button. Um, the download button um, will give you a robot, which you can then um, import into the development environment. Um, how this works, you will see in a few minutes. Okay. So then let's, with that knowledge, go back um, to our um, BPM platform. And um, with that, I want um, to go to the actual lead handling process, how it should look like. So this is, um, I would call it the to be state. Yeah? So now we are in the design phase. And here we can see, okay, we adapted the process a little bit. First of all, we added um, a robotic lane. So the notation here is a business process modeling notation, BPMN, standard notation for process mapping. And um, a lot of things can now be handled or should be handled by a robot. So as I mentioned before, um, everything that happens in Salesforce can be done automatically. Also all that Wikipedia stuff where I have to get some information, determine the priority and so on can be done by a robot. You can also send some information to the requester and um, finally also send some information to um, the customer even if in uh, if a sales guy has to be involved contact the sales guy and then he can uh, react immediately so that is the idea behind that why is it so important so maybe let's have a look at some details so um, typically what we see quite frequently is um, that organizations need to um, document their robotization different um, ways. Yeah? So this is a way um, how you could do it. So um, let me explain that a little bit. In um, the center or in the core, you have here that lead handling robot. So that is a robot we actually want to implement. He gets some data from an email which comes from a demo request yeah? and transmit the data into Salesforce. You have different people that are responsible from a technical perspective, from a development perspective, um, also from a professional perspective. You have some different activities that are executed and um, also a so-called robotic operating procedure. That's uh, what um, ROP stands for. What is that? So let me give you an example. Um, robotic operating procedure is a document. I just downloaded this. It's available in my single source of true, um, which is a document describing what the robot actually does. Yeah. So um, as you can see, this is um, of course not a document that I created manually, but this is something that can be extracted um, automatically from um, the um, RPA development environment. So this is um, quite easy actually and gives me a very detailed overview on the click level with the corresponding screenshots and some hints of course um, 
um, step by step for the end users maybe um, which describe what the what the robot actually does yeah? so again no manual effort um, also not for the screenshots <coughs> Um, this can be exported, of course, as Word uh, uh, um, file or even as a PowerPoint presentation or something like this. Then maybe you have some trouble, uh, troubleshooting procedures which um, can be attached with a corresponding, I don't know, PDF, Word document, whatever. So what I just want to say <coughs> is that this is really a reliable basis um, for the documentation. You can use all the reporting capabilities in order to automatically create also a large document if this is necessary and we see quite frequently. So here you really have a single source of truth. This is also very essential if you are thinking um, about the operations later on um, of the robots. So what we see quite frequently, very typical situation, so um, there is an SAP system used in an organization yeah, and the IT has to update this SAP system due to security reasons, for example. The IT does not have the detailed knowledge about the robots and what will happen finally, so they update the SAP system because they have to, and finally the robot breaks because this update comes with some additional UI changes or something like this, and this leads to the fact that the robot uh, or that the automation breaks. You have some manual effort in order to fix the robots, um, and this uh, with this approach here, you have a structured repository, structured information where you can just say, okay, I need to update the SAP system. I query on that, and I want to know um, what the robots are that are working with the SAP system, maybe also with a specific transaction, and um, you can just query that, you get a direct result, and you can take care of it before the robots break. Um, okay, so again, we now have all that different um, information in place. <clears throat> so now it comes, of course, to the robot development. Therefore, I want um, to go to my virtual machine here. Um, so for the development, we have a specific um, RPA development environment. So I don't want to show you now how to develop a robot. This is not possible, of course, in the time. But actually, you have a quite similar representation as in the task mining before. So you have the screenshots, a corresponding flow. And um, of course, um, you can do here all the different uh, implementation uh, steps, the refinement and configuration steps. And um, as you can see here, maybe just zoom out, uh, zoom in here a little bit. You already have here some additional things. Um, what should happen when an object is not found? Um, do I need a human intervention uh, for this, for example? And things like this. Uh, so you really have here the possibility if I was that to do a lot of things directly via the UI uh, without writing um, code. Of course, this is possible as well. Um, but um, the interesting thing, and one example for this is um, uh, this area here. So we are working here um, with patented image recognition technology. So um, the robot actually works in a quite similar way as people would do that. So um, it uh, looks at the images or um, at what you can see on the screen, and it looks here for example, um, for a number that is placed next to a label which, uh, which is called revenue. Yeah, so this is actually um, how it works, which makes it much more robust in, uh, in comparison. But let me show you how it looks like when such a robot is being executed. So let me uh, maybe take my colleague Julian. So I have uh, Julian, I have... Uh, Crum I and I get his uh, email address. Crum. I want to be contacted via email. So this is my lead formula. I send the request. <clears throat> and now, as you can see here on the bottom right corner, that the email is automatically sent out to the uh, marketing uh, uh, guy. And um, we already implemented the robot. Um, I just presented um, from the design perspective and this robot uses a specific trigger so actually it has a look at the inbox of the marketing guy and checks um, for exactly such requests mails and as you can now see already so um, it's not me now that is executing all this here and which is uh, opening at the moment Salesforce so this is actually also the robot you can see that next to the uh, to the to the mouse here where you have the loading images for example and uh, we get some hint that um, the robot is reading some data. So um, actually that is now executed autonomously. 
basically um, already at this point of time we distinguish in general between automated uh, between sorry attended and unattended robots unattended robots work completely autonomously typically on virtual machines while um, un uh, while attended uh, robots work typically on the employee on the client computer and supports him in doing his work where maybe you need some uh, human interaction of course as well so um, we have this here um, of course, an environment where we can uh, look at what the robot actually does. So it just created the lead in Salesforce. Um, it now uh, opens Wikipedia. It looks for software ages, and this is the company Julian is working for. He has a look uh, or reads the data from this wiki page. He has a look at the revenue and at the uh, number of employees, and he is automatically calculating a rating um, for this. He updates the lead in Salesforce, and with that, the robot <coughs> has done his job. What happened in the background? Let me jump into here <clears throat> my mail program. So this was the original request sent by the web form. Yeah. Um, then the robot started working and the first thing um, uh, he, he did of course is um, that he created the lead and um, he sent already some information to the requester. Yeah? So to Julian here directly where I say, okay, um, here you have um, for the meantime a webinar recording like this where you can have a look, uh, first look um, at our product. And um, I already want to ask you for two or three date proposals um, for, for a call. So obviously we have a high lead, uh, high lead um, priority here. So he already asked for some time for date. And in parallel, he sends um, an email to the sales guy where um, he sends um, the information on Salesforce. So a direct link where he can work with and he says, okay, I already asked the lead for uh, some web meeting proposals. Yeah, so all these things are done um, automatically by the robot. Okay, <clears throat> so obviously this works. Um, we have rolled this out from a technical point of view, and maybe um, you also want to communicate this to your organization. Yeah, of course we can um, bring <clears throat> the different things um, from the robot development also in our RS tool here. So you have the detailed models, really step by step, what the robot is actually doing. The interesting thing is that we have uh, some very user-friendly um, views here on this, so we can really click step by step through that with the corresponding screenshots again, which uh, and additional descriptions and information, which allows every people very um, easily to understand what is happening, what the robot is doing, what do I have to do if the robot stops working. So I can really click on that in order to get all the details with the screenshots. So very, very, very simple way on how to roll that out. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is the description of the rollout phase. And with that, I would like to hand back to um, Julian for a moment. All right, I hope you can hear me again. So, okay, automating is really fun, but does it really make sense? And as, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, with automation, you should always tackle a business problem. So at the end, so assume we automated our lead handling process uh, at the beginning of 2019, I would now like to see if we really improve our process. And what you can see here again, is our process mining dashboard. You can clearly see that the lost rate of our customers declined at the beginning of 2019. So that's already a positive signal that our automation contributed to a happier customer. And this is also seen here that the number of customer ones is really improved. The same is also from a processing process cycle time. So for those customers, we are still losing. We can even reduce the number of time we need to spend with them. And also the qualifying out of customers or potential customers is also improved. Not only that, what we can also do is we can actually validate the robot deployment from a conformance perspective. So what we can do is we can automatically compare the new adapted process with how it really behaves. So first of all, how the robot behaves, but also if there are still some manual activities, if our colleagues in, in, the, in the back office 
are working as it should be according to the adaptive process. And this can also be validated. So what you can clearly see here, the conformance of our processes are much, much improved at the beginning of 2019, 19, thanks to the robot. And so this is, is really perfect. And last but not least, from an impact perspective, we can also measure this, of course. So what you can see here, first of all, we were able to reduce the processing time of our lead handling by 73%. With that, we could also uh, increase the number of leads that were processed. And also with that, the conversion rate was successfully improved, which of course then is also reflected in the revenue that we make with our uh, customers. What you can also see that the leads that are handled are yeah, now a little bit stabilized. So of course, when you roll out a new robot and deploy it, it, it may take some time that everything uh, works well. Maybe you need some, some adjustments, but here after a while, it's really stable and it contributes also to the, uh, to the business effect, so the positive business effect that you want to achieve with, with uh, robotic process automation. And that's basically also the goal so we, we identified at the very beginning a business problem. We thought that, okay, you, we may tackle this with an automation uh, initiative. Then we thought that in our crying tool, how to automate th those things, how you can uh, document and describe the new adapted and robotized process. And now at the end, you can also verify and also communicate this to your to your senior management etc that we really improved the process and we have achieved a successful business outcome yeah and with that i would like to hand over again to tom yeah thank you very much so i think this is really very very important um, um yeah, picture at the end which can um, in a very good way be communicated um, to the management finally um, I think that is already what we wanted to um, show you as a brief overview of the solution um, directly in the tool. Um, maybe just to recap a little bit. Um, so what did we do now? First of all, sorry. First of all, um, we focused on the discovery phase. So how can we use process mining BPA, BPM to identify some bottlenecks in my processes? So the really critical points from a, uh, from, um, a business point of view. Um, we did some analysis using task mining, respectively process discovery, um, in order to get an unbiased view on what is happening in reality and have a basis for further improvement of the, um, of the processes and of the automation. Um, the improvement is then being done, of course, um, from a conceptual point of view in the design uh, phase where we have the possibility to describe what you want to achieve, to describe how you achieve it, and finally also to embed it into your process landscape to have finally yeah, a robotized or robotic process landscape. We then used the results from two and three, so from the analysis with task mining and the design to, um, <coughs> to develop the actual robot. So um, we exported from task mining the information um, as a robot into the development environment, um, refined that, configured that um, in order to have the final robot in place. We deployed that. Um, of course, with different possibilities to analyze that. Um, of course, we also have the possibility um, to have a look at the um, robot actions in detail. Um, so not part of the demo, but of course, this is possible as well. And finally, to communicate, uh, capture the benefits first of all, and communicate it then to the management, which again closes the cycle more or less, and um, then hopefully delivers the basis um, to be able to further grow and scale with RPA successful. So with that, um, we are at the end of our today's um, content or the, uh, the the content part of um the the webinar at least and um i think if there are some we still have a few minutes um for some questions if there are some thank you tom and julian so um if you want to ask a question please feel free to unmute yourself or post a question into the chat window there is already a first question. Um, do you have experience with process mining and task mining in an IT environment, which is an API ecosystem? 
Um, maybe we need to clarify this question um, a little bit. So maybe you can uh, make it a bit more concrete. So um, typically there are, um, of course, different systems um, available or in place in an organization. Some of them have an API, some of them have not. That might also depend on some uh, um, on some use cases. Um, but uh, finally, what we see that typically we are, of course, able to connect to the different systems with, uh, with, uh, with process mining. So there are many different possibilities to directly connect to the database. Sometimes there's also direct connector to the corresponding um, system. And um, uh, at the same time, it's not always possible to integrate the different systems. Yeah, so this is actually the problem. While again, we have the possibility to access this with process mining. With task mining, there is um, in general no problem since again, we are not connecting to um, to um, the systems directly, but um, it's a client on the employee computer, um, which um, is tracking the interaction of the employee with um, with the application that is used to execute the process. And um, therefore there is um, in general, um, no specific limitations. Hope this answers the question. Are there further questions? Again, please feel free to uh, post this directly into the chat window or even into the um, Q&A window with that. There is a further question from Tangi. Um, how complex is the installation um, of task mining? So, um, in fact, the, the installation is, is not quite um, complex. It's, um, I would say, um, straightforward. So, um, there are two different things, in fact, you need. The first is um, you have a central server, um, the so-called discovery server, um, which needs to be installed first. And the second is um, that uh, you have, again, the discovery bots. So, um, the bots communicate with the server, of course. So, um, all the tracked um, interactions are sent to the server and the server then does the work. So he consolidates um, the different activities, try to automatically identify based on um, artificial intelligence um, approaches um, to identify some patterns in that. This can be then, of course, um, fine-tuned um, especially. And um, on the client side, so on the discovery robot side, um, you also have the possibility um, to prevent some waste here. So you have different possibilities of white and black blacklisting of applications um, um, to, to just focus on um, the processes you're actually interested in. I hope this answers the question. Then there is... Um, Another question, um, will the slides be shared with the attendees? Um, I think um, we can do that. So what will be shared um, anyway um, is, of course, a recording of the webinar. So I think, um, I don't know, Christina, maybe you can answer that. Um, you have the experiences here. Yeah, we will upload the recording um, to YouTube and you will receive a link to the recording and we can also send out the slides if you want. Okay, perfect. Of course. Very good. I think we um, might have time for one additional question, if there are additional questions. Okay, I think this does not seem the case. So, and with that, um, I think we are then already at the end of the webinar. We are perfect in time, I think, so it's one minute early and um, yeah. Thank you very much for your um, for your attendance here and hope to see you in the next webinar of ours as well. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.